slide and then just uh, go on to the main demo of the thing. Hopefully it works. Uh. So yeah, uh, I'm just naming it Gradient Ascent. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> going step by step. Just looking at the small gradient vector, but just going up the hill to autonomy or something. So my build is this uh, just the off the shelf uh, WaveShare JetBot kit. It has Jetson Nano and a wide angle camera and motors and that's it. Uh, the actuator, actuators are just the motor and it's a two wheel drive, differential drive with uh, the ball bearing socket in the front, like uh, uh, auto or something and uh, batteries. Uh, so it's just lithium ion batteries. So yeah, uh, what I am interested in as a problem space is three things. One is uh, I was working in NLP before, but now I want to work in robotics because like I think the problems there are more interesting and also it has first order impact on the world. Like you directly uh, impact on increasing something like productivity or something instead of like helping people to increase the productivity. Like for example, translation helps people who are already there to increase their productivity, but maybe something like a bot that can go and fertilize the fields is directly adding value or something. But that's just an abstract thing. But uh, main idea is like, I thought like animals could do stuff without, you know, fancy language. Why not? Um, maybe they do have languages, but at least the basic tasks, they could maybe accomplish it more robustly. So um, so automating that would, might be the next step to even language. Like uh, you need some kind of embodiment to learn a language in a robust manner. Uh, so Currently, people are working on stuff like uh, fusing language and vision representations together. Maybe the next step is like you add the representations. I mean, by representations, I mean like in deep learning, there are these representations that are uh, generated by the model itself, which is not interpretable directly, but it is useful if you try and use those representations in some other task. Like you train it on a image and uh, uh, text data set and then you can use it for pretty much uh, some text task for which it wasn't trained for. So the representations are more abstract and useful. Um, that is one thing. And then uh, one thing I'm interested in is like, uh, so the first part might be like, you might have some reinforcement learning in it and stuff like that, where you design the rewards and the bot might figure it out by itself. Uh, now that I, I have seen like NVIDIA, NVIDIA has this ISAC simulators that are a bit powerful and people are starting to use it for research. Like uh, you can pretty much do what you were doing in CPUs for reinforcement learning and a lot of CPUs. Now you could do it in a single GPU or something. Like uh, in ETH, I think there has been research on a uh, rover that uh, with legged robotics uh, learning to move by itself. Uh, but it was trained completely using uh, synthetic data and it's working robustly in the real world in different surfaces. So I think simulations might help a little bit to, because uh, the simulations in the GPU and stuff like that might be uh, accelerating some stuff forward. Then the imitating humans part is like, you just show some stuff to the robot and let's assume how do you learn a policy out of it? That is one thing I'm interested in. And finally, how do you uh, use the representations or whatever you're learning from being in an environment and uh, uh, using that to inc augment the uh, stuff you could do with language? Because in language, a lot of things are not uh, visible. Like you never say black sheep, you just say sheep and we, are, we know it is white by context. So um, that is a typical example that is given in NLP or in, for missing context problem and uh, maybe embodiment along with vision, not just vision, but doing stuff in the environment, how do you get back language representations from them? So yeah, so this was a quote I remember from this book, I haven't read it fully, but yeah, it talks a lot about language and how context is important and how language is not a single, uh, it doesn't have a single meaning or something. So now the next question, question I would like to think about is if our robot could talk, should we understand it? Like, 
um if I, by that what i mean is like um, should the representations be interpretable and is that the key to something like ai ethics and stuff like that like uh, if a robot uh, i know it's pretty abstract that we don't have any fancy sci-fi robots yet but in the path to building it uh, i think uh, venkatesh has put in his blog post about uh, not a substack post about um isaac asimov's three laws so how do you encode that into robots like should a robot essentially understand some aspects of our language and share some context and vocabulary to even express ethical context i don't know so that's a pretty abstract question so yeah the concrete research angle i am looking at is uh, pretty much laid out in this video by peter abil and towards a general solution for robotics so in which he talks about uh, four um, major missing parts that in which the current research is going on and that could be worked at one is unsupervised representation learning from internet and video text and using it for robotics the other is like um, training a lot in sim, sim to real like you train a lot in simulator and then uh, apply it in the real world then generally pre training is done is the ba- main way to accomplish low data um, tasks by training a huge model on something unsupervised like a uh, lot of text uh, language model it and then um, you know fine tune it on the task you are you care about and even in computerization you train it on image net and now they have a lot of unsupervised or self supervised methods where you just use the data as the label like you hide some of it and try to denoise it or something and you do it in a large scale and then the representations are general enough that you could just fine tune on a smaller data set than what was there at 2012 when image net came about now you could take a subset of that and use this self supervised models and then fine tune it a bit and get similar performance as them so how do you do that in reinforcement learning like you have so many different tasks that might not share affordances and a lot of other details so that's a angle of research then few shot imitation learning is like you just demonstrate a few demonstrations to the robot like show it around a joystick or something and then um how does it uh, uh how does it help then finally human in the loop rl is like generally you don't have access to reward functions and designing them is very hard in reinforcement learning so in reinforcement learning you have to like design something called a reward uh, which guides your mo- uh, agent to do some task you want it to accomplish but uh, generally giving a reward is a hard task by itself like uh, how do you define rewards that uh, really that can't be hackable like or else the models just fit on something and it can hack the reward instead of doing what you wanted to do so human in the loop rl is like uh, you put a human in between but obviously like you can't ask the human to provide rewards for every action so you have to have a way to minimize the um, number of times a human is being enqueried and make it more as informative as possible so that that information can be added to some reward signal so that is the third uh, fourth thing so yeah th- uh, this video talks about the bunch of current works in it and yeah i am pretty much have to start looking at the papers that has been already published and i may try to do a you know um just compile them together in a blog post or something so that i understand everything and then maybe i iterate on it or i'll try to even um, replicate some of it over the course of time hi so, i am pete i don't have time for this yeah. yeah so what's done in the current thing is like i uh, yeah yesterday my camera module stopped working and then i was fiddling around it was just the wires uh, finally so i try to flash the thing again and yeah so what is done is now just the Uh, i just trained a collision avoidance module by just taking pictures of blocked or not blocked in my room and then that is one thing object follower as this uh, coconut is a object detection module where it has it is trained on 90 classes of objects and then you could use it to you know figure out where the object is in a camera and then just follow it then tele operation in joystick is pretty much uh, which is these are all part of the example code so uh, it is 
So I have to like iterate upon it. Yeah, I'll just uh, now show the code and maybe adjust my camera so that you can see the bot in the operation. Can you stop sharing so we can see a bigger screen? Or I guess yeah. Works. Um, so should I, uh, I thought I'll show both the code and the, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I think we can rearrange the windows or if we do speaker view, hmm. side by side speaker. I'm trying to like get a good look at both the code. Oh yeah, if you do side by side speaker view, you can just resize both windows and you'll be able to see both well if anybody else wants to do that. Um. So that's the rover. I'm not sure how to zoom this camera. So, yeah. Mm. Can you move your coffee cup? Yeah. Thank you. So this is just the basic motion code. It is. Uh, so the thing is, the these people have um, given a code wherein um, they have pretty much abstracted a lot of stuff in. But I I will be dismantling it and try to come up with my own abstraction soon. But I wanted to do that yesterday, but this camera module uh, threw me off. So, yeah. Mm. So this is basically in the uh, REPL of Jupyter Notebooks, which is like a REPL, online REPL, wherein you can just put stuff in and it works. So that's hello world, <laughs> so the robot. <laughs> so. Yeah, pretty much it's just sending signals to the uh, motors and then it's just. So currently the API is like this, like uh, they have this uh, thing called traitlets and Python. It's just like you can bind stuff to it and listen on values. So like the robots, um, uh, what is it? Uh, speed or something is a value and you can the turn turning speed or the RPM and you can just set it for some value and let it uh, execute it. And you can listen whether what is happening in that value. So yeah, so this is uh, pretty much it. And the GUI for it is like, you can see in the screen, like you can bind uh, stuff to the value. And this is like uh, mostly in G, uh, sorry, okay. So you can use these um, uh, left, what is, whatever panel that has been created in the Jupyter to control this. But I, I think I'm not going to use this for the later half of the project, but yeah. So I'll show the object detection thing. So here, the, um, is the robot visible? Yep. So, yeah, so this pretty much involved me collecting data of uh, whether um, whether a path is blocked or free or something. So this is blocked. If you see my screen, you'll just see the it's an image of a blocked scenario and a free. So the model that has been trained is not robust at all because like I haven't you have to at least even with 100 data you have to like do a lot of tricks like augmenting it and then doing different lighting conditions but yeah i just run it uh, so after collecting the data i just trained it in my computer and then uploaded the model back to the rover but i could have just trained it there because it's not big data so, so this is like uh, i have fine-tuned the uh, resnet 18 model which is a standard computer vision model that has been trained in the imagenet task so I just fine-tuned it on data of whether a path is blocked or free. So it's just a classifier that predicts whether it's blocked or free. So uh, one thing is like just Jetson Nano board has uh, CUDA cores in it. So it could run, um, I think it's Maxwell architecture with 200 or some course, so it can run these deep learning models uh, efficiently. Uh, uh, in optimized manner, it doesn't have to take too much time to run. So, yeah. 
So, so the classifier was trained on the robot's own uh, training data, right? Yeah. Like if it ran into something and stopped, that would be coded as a blocked. And if it continued to go, it would be coded as free. You didn't tag it. No, I tagged it. Like I oh, kept. I could have. I had done. I did it in two ways, and one way is convenient. I tried to use the joystick to navigate it everywhere, and then click pictures of blocked or not blocked. But uh, yeah, uh, what you are saying is one thing interesting. I was thinking about like active learning method wherein, but this doesn't have any sensors to detect that it hit something. I I'll try to integrate a cheap sensor and maybe try to do what you are saying. Like uh, there is. there needs to be a sensor to know that it is stuck somewhere this the only sensor in this robot and for now is the camera so so hopefully this works yeah so you could see the camera view in the jupiter notebook that i am displaying so the idea is like this block zero is the classification and the speed is you can set the speed So I'll just link the code and then I can. Yeah, this will take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So this pretty much uh, next thing I might be trying is try ROS or something and see how the entire ROS thing works because I have just seen that it's just a bunch of queues or something where each process listens on the queue and you can publish and subscribe from the queue. So. yeah so now i increase the speed of the rover and it starts rowing hopefully the yeah so it detected that that part was a obstacle and then pretty much it. it's just the code that was i think i didn't do anything much here I wanted to do it, but yeah. Um, now it is off the screen, but I think you can see it in the code view. I I try to make the underside of the bed as obstacle, but I don't know how well it works. Let's just see. Can you click the speed? Um, yeah, it's working. So I made the made the underside of the bed as an obstacle, and uh, uh, pretty much it classified it as as such. So it didn't it didn't go inside. Hmm. So in a way, when you're tagging an obstacle, you're really defining a geo fence, not yeah, fence. exactly. Learning your idea of a geo yeah, fence. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. So it's not an obstacle, obstacle. It's more like, and if I leave something out, it's like. a geo fence may based out of image patches so maybe if i put the bed as an obstacle uh, if i have the same texture somewhere else it will just detect that as an obstacle so have you tried it outside your room no i, I actually had trained it in my previous room in india and i tried to use it here it was horrible it started to circle <laughs> circle around so yeah that, that is one thing that is no Like I just use hundred images, fifty block, hundred blocked and hundred not blocked. So, yeah, but it should be enough. Like more than hundred for a single room is too much. If you in the real world setting also, like, yeah. So it's working a bit, but some it got stuck. <laughs> so. Yeah. So uh, I I think like uh, maybe I can do. Uh, okay, I'll just stop this and show what I'm planning for the next. Uh... Yeah. So I was. The... Yeah. About the hardware, like why is the antenna so big? Um, uh, because I don't know. It, okay. it just came with it. I thought like, uh, okay. because it, maybe it helps with the reception. Like it's connected to my Wi-Fi, and uh, so the operation is through Wi-Fi. So okay. Maybe. And, and it has DC motors, right? 
Yeah. Okay. And the connectors are similar to what Raspberry Pi has. Uh, I'll just show it once. Uh, just put it here. So the camera module's connector is this uh, ribbon cable. Okay. And there's this G. How do I call it? GPIO. I don't know. Uh, yeah. This. Yeah. And then the circuit board is pretty much, uh, they have made it into a single board with no wires, soldered everything inside it. So the connections between the battery and uh, there's a OLED here okay. where you have a display of, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, the IP address and stuff that, that is useful, like the battery charge of the robot and everything. Okay. Yeah, this board is what they had given the bottom board. The top board is a Jetson Nano developer kit. Jetson Nano is basically under this heat sink. It is just a small chip that you can okay. directly use it. But you, this developer board is what gives you access to Ethernet and all the other things. Like that is given by NVIDIA themselves. Like so that this becomes like a Raspberry Pi. Okay. And then, so you can attach all the hats uh, which Raspberry Pi has. Yeah, you can attach pretty much everything. And these are the pins that you could use for the yeah. any other connections like the I don't know. Yeah, I don't know much about electronics. It seems so. like the 20 a 40 pin header yeah, Raspberry yeah, Pi has. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, I'm wondering like uh, it has this heat sink. It's a big heat sink. I'm not sure whether it's even I don't know. Okay. I had to run a big model for a lot of time to see. I'm oh, sure okay. the battery would run out before the Okay. That's coming. <laughs> so, um, I, I I have a question. You know, on yeah. Raspberry Pi, the hats uh, have an EEPROM in order to notify the Raspberry what the hat is doing. I'm wondering if it supports that as well. It has what on? Sorry. An EEPROM. In other words, uh, the the uh, Raspberry Pi can recognize which hat is attached, it talks to it and configures things. Yeah, I had to uh, poke around a bit. I don't know. Like, I, 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 I had to see how the GPIO connection is being detected in the board and stuff like that. I haven't yet explored that much. So, Does it have any like CPU also beside the... Uh... Yeah, it has an ARM... Um, I don't know how much megahertz. Yeah, it has a CPU. Ah, okay. I think I put up in the... Yeah, so... Okay, Quad A57. Cortex A57 processor. So basically, you can run ROS on the A57 and then... Yeah. Unload the machine learning to yeah. the GPU, right? So the next thing I wanted to uh, check out is like this framework is pretty much like a toy framework, which uh, they have written to make it work for uh, Jupyter. Uh, so I just want to decouple it and either uh, run my own framework or just use ROS. Try how ROS works to get an idea of what is it. And I have, I have little, I learned it a bit, but not applied it much. So. And then yeah, there is this mono slam where you have the monocular camera and try to localize and map the environment together. So I'm just learning about slam now. So I, I might be doing that. Then uh, if you use a monocular camera, you don't have the depth information. So maybe use a pre-trained depth estimation model and deep learning to get depth. Then maybe that could be used for something cool like uh, even obstacle detection without much. Uh, um, no, I don't have to train a lot of images and see how robust these depth models are. Then, ah, uh, yeah. So NVIDIA, has, so this kit is basically from NVIDIA and they outsource the production to some partners like WaveShare. So they have, they are pushing this ISAC a lot. So this, um, sorry. I don't know. Mm. I just 
So yeah, so they have this model in already assets and everything their Isaac uh, sim library, but this Isaac sim is pretty or pretty hard to set it up. They have so many components and they need the specific Ubuntu version and everything. So it's pain in the ass to set it up. But after you set it up, they have this tutorial of a lane follower that uses some reward function to just, you know, follow the lanes. It's not a pretty, <laughs> you don't have to do RL for it, but yeah. So it's just a demo where you try, the idea of it is like you try to do something called domain randomization in RL which is pretty much the main technique I think people are using for sim to real where uh, you tweak a lot of parameters in the simulators so that the model learns something robust. Like uh, you change the lighting, you change the friction, you change different parameters of the environment and uh, fit the same RL model again and again in the same environment so that it learns something that is more invariant to those changes. So, um, yeah, so if you can see this, uh, this is how the domain randomization looks like. They put pretty much a lot of things that are in the air or something and change the color scheme and everything. So it's just a step above data augmentation that is used in computer vision. Or it could even be seen as a, I would like to see it as a, you are learning something causally invariant and you are showing a lot of uh, uh, things that vary, but the bro, the thing has to learn something that is invariant to those changes. So, yeah, this is how it should look like, but I had to get this, uh, the same mat or something, the Lego uh, road to make it work. Mm, then for, for yeah. this uh, monocular slam, there is a library called orb slam. Okay. You could use that. I just posted the links in discord. Oh, sure. Mm, yeah, I'll see. Uh, like, uh, I want to learn how Slam exactly works. So I'll be trying to implement it in maybe a rudimentary version of it. And then I'll also look into these libraries so that. Uh, I think University of Zurich also, one of the researchers I've seen uh, doing monocular Slam. Hmm. There's some good work there. Yeah, the Simtorial also, they have a big they won, I think they won one of the underground DRPA challenge or something. Like you need a bot that has to survive a lot of time underground in a mine mining shaft or something. I'll just search it once again. Subterranean challenge. Yeah, the researcher's name is uh, Davide Scaramuza. Oh, okay. Let's search for it. So this was an interesting challenge that went through. I ha I haven't seen it much, but yeah, I just saw it in Twitter or something. Yeah, then um, I'll try an imitation learning approach. Instead of this reinforcement learning, what if you do the same lane follower or something, but use it, a human demonstrated few times and then it has to do as good as the RL agent trained in a simulated environment. So, yeah, then maybe Docker and I'll set up open VPN, uh, which has been already put up in our channel by Victor. So yeah, that's it. Oh, you're in grad school now, right? So what's your program about and what are you researching? And is this kind of like aligned with that? Yeah. Uh, so mine is a master's program now. So it's more like, uh, yeah, most of it is aligned to that. I'm taking robot mapping course now. And then uh, more than the courses, I would say like I could just do, just do them in Coursera. But the idea is like there are a lot of labs here um, in Freiburg, like uh, Wolfram Burgard uh, has a big lab in robotics here. He's one of the authors of big 
books like probabilistic robotics robotics yeah is he uh, still there is it he at uh, toyota research institute uh, yeah he is in here for the name but he is not here like uh, uh, okay this uh, grad students or some um, others run the lab and then so yeah there, there, there are pretty there are a lot of there is this computer vision lab and then there is this neuro robotics lab and uh, there's a robot learning lab which is pretty much focused on uh, how do you use reinforcement learning for robotics so yeah i'm pretty much looking at roles there maybe i'll get it this semester or else the next semester so the, the idea i want to work on is like i i would be at, in the meanwhile i'll try to you know process these papers in and try to replicate some results and stuff like that and meet people who are doing that also that's the main thing <laughs> right we can discuss for a couple more minutes if people have more questions okay. and i'm here. interested in oh, sorry right yeah no, god <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm interested in understanding um, how much, we don't have an answer now, but how much having this uh, Jetson uh, GPU on board, um, I shouldn't say distorts, but how you uh, look at the rover. Hmm. Okay, so most of us have rovers which either have no brain or have a little brain, and you have a rover which has a brain which is very big for certain things. And I'm just wondering how that's going to change the natural evolution of that rover. Mm. I'm not I'm not sure yet. Like uh, maybe it will help us do some I'm not sure in the Mars environment how that's going to change things like how much autonomy uh, autonomy in the sense of um, autonomy to accomplish a task like uh, let's say you have resource gathering or something and you want the ro rover to adjust to some circumstances you don't know necessarily but you know what's the task so would those really need a reinforcement learning model as the control policy rather than you writing the code for it that's the case running those models might be the way for the rover to do those things autonomously. Mm -hmm. mm. Then in the overall design space, maybe it's the same thing we were discussing before about cameras eating everything. So would that mean like having a big brain is a prerequisite for that? Like you just, you, because uh, of the communication lag between Mars and the Earth, maybe you do need the brain there, at least a bit of it, so that you can run these powerful models without having to talk back to the control station every time. So, um, I think a useful metaphor here is to think of like um, how rover intelligence is adapted to the domain in convergent and divergent ways, right? Like uh, all... Uh, uh, fish and whales and sharks all kind of live in the ocean. And in some senses, their intelligence is convergent. They all end up in that like, you know, spindle shaped body or whatever. But in other ways, uh, whales have pretty different brains from like tropical fish or something like that. They're much smarter. Dolphins are super smart. So uh, that would be kind of interesting to almost define a rover IQ in, in relation to the domain. So a domain specific measure of intelligence that says, in these convergent ways, all rovers have to be um, at least 100 points smart, like, you know, obstacle avoidance with certain levels of minimum uncertainty. It might lead to like a feature of the brain that's the equivalent of like spindle shape in fish. Like maybe it needs a certain minimum level of uh, GPU training ability. But in other dimensions, maybe a lot of variation is possible. So I think that's actually a very interesting question to explore, just like measuring the intelligence of a rover. 
Yeah, it's also interesting uh, for exploration, but also it could uh, lead to some kind of bench benchmark, uh, something much simpler. Okay, but a benchmark for us to evaluate, uh, you know, the different solutions we we come up with, and also the design of a benchmark can be harder than it looks, and uh, it's something we could also discuss because we already have a bunch of uh, approaches to to rove, to map, and to to uh, to do stuff like that. Um, pretty interesting, and actually, it could be a research topic if someone is interested uh, in some university somewhere here in this group. Yep, uh, I think we have a page of uh, research topics, jobs, or something. I'll remember to add it to that. But uh, all right, I guess that's actually a good segue point to switch to discussion of our demo day. So I'm going to share my screen. So 